103.1 Hello and welcome to My Musical Journey with myself Hayley Anderson uh, on 3TFM Radio. You can find us online at www.3tfm.org or on the airwaves at 103.1 FM. And on today's show, we have Adam Robertson. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and tell me about yourself? Hi, my name is Adam Robertson. I am a guitarist uh, originally from Irvine. I now live in East Ayrshire. Um, I've been a musician, professional touring musician, since about 2012. But, you know, I studied music. My family's all, my sisters are musical as well. So, you know, I've, I've been playing music since I was, you know, knee high to a grasshopper. And um, I've just been lucky enough to make a living out of it for the past, best part of the past decade. So, yeah. You mentioned about your family there. So did um, music, was music a part of your life growing up, like right from the get go? Not, this is a weird thing. Not really. Um, it was only, um, like, I, I don't remember my mum or dad being really heavily into music or into bands or anything like that. Um, but my older sister started taking keyboard lessons when she was about eight or nine. So then um, I, I just remember my mum wanting to encourage me into, thing, into it as well, but not forcing me. So um, one time there was a family friend around and I would have been about eight. And they said, oh, I bet you couldn't do it. And I don't like being told that I can't do something. So I followed this path purely on the words of somebody, you know, kind of goading me that I couldn't do it. And, um, you know, eventually I kind of, the music bug bit. So yeah, older sister, she played keyboard and then we got uh, gifted a piano from somebody and it was absolutely atrocious. <laughs> it was completely out of tune. So then, you know, we, we when the parents saw that, or when our parents saw that we were a little bit more serious about this, they, they bought us a proper piano. So um, I learned piano from about the age of eight. Then in, um, in school, you had the, I don't know if you, if you ever did this, uh, learning an instrument in school, you had the pitch test thing. Um, so again, in school being told, oh, the, somebody had the highest score ever. It was 29 out of 30. So me being a cocky little so-and-so thought, well, I'm going to get 30 out of 30 here. And sure enough, I did. So um, yeah, at school, I uh, I played brass from about the age of 10, right the way till I left, through prim- the end of primary school, right the way through to the end of high school. And we went a couple of tours with the brass band because when I was at, at school, at secondary school, the brass band was actually really good. Um, and we had a really, really good, really strong music department at our secondary school, which was Greenwood Academy in Dreghorn. And yeah, from from there, um, yeah, my older sister was sort of like the inspiration. Then I, I came along. It was only when I got to secondary school and I'd already done piano and then brass, so reading music wasn't a problem. I then discovered these things with six strings sitting with dust on them in the corner of the, the music room. So looked at a guitar and thought, that's that's the one for me. So just really picked that up and ran with it. And then my little sister came along and played drums and stuff as well. So right now, older sister's a, a coloratura soprano singer. I'm a guitarist, my little sister, a, she's a singer and drummer as well. And she's married to a jazz drummer. <laughs> really in the family then? Is your mum and dad yeah. into music or is it uh, just your siblings? This is the thing. Um, my my dad always says he met my mum when he was playing music in a Cayley band. My dad can play about four chords, but I guess that's that's all you really needed back then. So he, um, my dad can play a little bit, little bit of guitar, but my mum is near enough tone deaf. She can't hold a tune. It's it's bizarre. <laughs> so you've got a little dog with you there. What's her name? Yes, this is this is Poppy. She's just my my little shadow. If I'm in the studio, she's in the studio with me. She just she she'd hate it if I'm out here and she's left in the house. So she's just kind of comes over. She'll sit in my ear. She'll go around about the studio and just do as she pleases. <laughs> is she a wee Jack Russell? Yes, yeah, she is. Still a little miniature Jack Russell. <laughs> a wee companion. Um, so, is, have you got your own little studio set up there, like next to your house? Or? 
this is my this is um, out out the back of my house. I've got my my own studio set up. We're looking at maybe about fifteen feet by twenty odd feet, but twenty one feet or something. So it's a decent size. I use it mostly for for little bits of you know. I, I studied um, commercial music and then I went on and did a, a master's degree in sound for visual image at Glasgow School of Art. So through that. I, I kind of keep a hand in doing a little bit of um, radio production. Um, I've done, I think since lockdown, I've, I've produced uh, three radio adverts that have went out on, I think, West Sound, West FM. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of do little bits, of, little bits of things like that, little bits of um, my own little kind of videos for pupils and things like that, just to, the, I found that with the remote learning, sometimes it's better for a pupil to have a video of something like a tricky passage in a song where they can take it back and replay it and replay it. So I've just been recording them out here. So other than that, this is this is really just my my little fortress of solitude where, you know, if I want to go and jam out and play some music, I can come out here and crank a half stack up without annoying the neighbours. So it's great. <laughs> Your own little man cave. <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. Um so was it like was it always decided you're going to go and do like music at, at at university, or did that just come along? Or I think for me, I got I got towards the end of school. My older sister went and studied music at, at Edinburgh University, so it was a little a little bit more um, towards the classical side of things. So what kind of classical composition, etc. And I'm I actually went for an interview there based on the strength of oh. This is Linda's brother. He wants to come and study there. So I went over. I'd mentioned in my in my application that I played euphonium. Turned up for the interview and they said, oh, so you're here to play euphonium for us. And I had two guitars in my hand. And I went, no. <laughs> so needless to say, didn't, didn't get in there. But um, yeah, I got to the end of school. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I always thought, well, I enjoy music. I love not just not just playing, but I love recording. I love sound. Um, I'd had a little bit of a taste of recording using a facility that used to be in Stevenson called the Cali Centre. I don't know if it's even still there anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of had the, the bug for recording, so I thought, well, if I can if I can continue doing that, studying that, let's let's do that. But I looked for a course that, as well as had kind of an element of performance and recording, also had an introduction to sort of the business side of things because growing up when you want to be a musician nobody tells you how to invoice for a gig nobody tells you you know e even even when you get proficient on your instrument nobody tells you what the going rate is to charge for doing session work or the likes so you know I wanted to have a to have a look at a course that that really seemed to encompass that and for me the commercial music course that was then at Paisley University which is now University West of Scotland um, that just seemed to tick all the boxes for me and it was also within driving distance because it was at Craigie down at Ayr it was within driving distance from my home so I didn't really need to do the thing that I've seen all my friends who were studying things up at Glasgow and they're, they're getting up at the crack of dawn to go for the train I've, I've never really liked getting up that early I hated getting up early for school so being able to get up a little bit later and drive to somewhere that only took 20 minutes just again appealed to me so yep I went to went went down to Craigie and spent four years there. How did you find the course did it like what was it was it what you were looking for? Yeah yeah in many in many ways it was I mean it was it was great in that they had they had really great ties to you know, alumni that had left and had actually done really well in the music industry. I think one girl was working with, I think, Coldplay. Somebody else was working, running, um, I've completely taken out. I think it was DF Concerts. I think somebody was working working with them, doing really well. Every now and again, they'd have somebody that would come back and do like guest lectures. So it, it really just showed you that the doors, the doors were all open there. But um, yeah, many, many people that I, that I went to uni with have went on into into a lot of them went on done really well in the music industry but then some other people went off into careers that are seem at first glance completely unrelated but there's been enough of a crossover in their skill set that they've just went from strength to strength to strength um i think one girl one girl went on uh, allison i think she's now like the events coordinator down in london for for one of the high-end fashion brands and 
travels all over the world doing doing really big sort of um, promotional activities. So it's it's been it was a really good time while I was there. Yeah. So I think we'll go into your first song then. Is it the Who um, don't get fooled again? Do you want to tell me like why you picked that one? Well, won't get fooled again for me when I when I was at secondary school. You know, starting to experiment with listening to music. Maybe actually just bef- just before going to secondary school, I always remember my friend across the road, where my parents didn't really seem to have much of a much of a record collection or much of a taste in music. I remember my friend Greg that lived across the road. His dad John had just the most amazing record collection that I've ever seen. And we still had a turntable in the house, so I just always remember going across and pilfering his Greg's dad's record collection. And the very first album I ever bought was Tommy by The Who. And that just sent me on a complete journey of discovering every single album that they ever had. And then I remember getting to getting to hear Won't Get Fooled Again for the first time. And it was like, you know, it was like a bolt of lightning hitting you, me hearing this guitar come in and thinking, what on earth is that? I I want to do that. I don't know. Didn't know anything really much about the setup. Didn't really know much about their guitars. I just knew that I wanted to make that level of noise. And then um, they did a tour when when I would I would have been maybe first or second year at uni. It's probably not uni, at secondary school. And they came around. They were playing the SECC, and I begged my dad to take me take me and go and see them. Uh, little did I know it was the last tour that they ever did with John Entwistle still alive on bass. And the opening act was Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros as well. And I'm quite a fan of The Clash as well. So getting to see both of these just, you know, it was like the the doors to the music world had been blown wide open by that track. So yeah, Won't Get Fooled Again is the track that just made me think, yep, that's that's it. I want to do that. I want to make that noise. So we kind of left off university stuff there. So you've graduated now and what did you end up doing straight after university? Like what was your path straight afterwards? Straight after university. Well, while I was at university, I'd been working part time uh, for one of the kind of major high street uh, bookies. And it was, while I was there, it was a great, great student job because you used to get like um, extra time for bank holidays and time and a half on Sundays and things like that. So. It was a really, it, it was great to be working and earning money, but at the same time, I'd been porting about with different bands and I played for a Queen tribute band. And we, you know, we were we were doing, doing okay, but we didn't really have any great management at the time. So um, in between, after coming out of uni, I took a look about, I wasn't playing regular enough to justify kind of going full time as a musician at that point. And I thought, I don't really know what, what I want to do, but I took a look back at my dissertation. My dissertation kind of went sideways a little bit from music in that one of the one of the courses my last year at uni was called Recording for Media Level Three, I think it was, and in that you had to take a, a, a trailer or sorry, not a trailer, a short film, strip all the audio off it and rebuild everything, but you weren't allowed to use sound effects libraries or anything. If you wanted sound effects, you had to record them and make them yourself. So I spent a lot of time doing what's called Foley work, which is like, you know, you see you see somebody in television set a cup down. There might not have been any audio recorded for that. So somebody has to watch that on a screen and then the studio record placing things down at the same time. And I found this absolutely fascinating to the point where I wrote my dissertation on the professional identities of Foley artists. Um, so when I when I found myself, you know, it's the summer after uni, I'm sitting working in the bookies thinking, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go from here? I thought, well, I've built up enough enough of a skill set doing recording that I thought as well as doing music production, I could maybe kind of sidestep into doing little post-production for film and television. So um, I applied for the master's degree at Glasgow School of Art doing sound for the visual image which a lot of it is exactly that. It's post-production for film and television, taking a little bit more of a deeper look at the kind of, you know, reasoning and aesthetics behind film sound and film scoring, etc. Um, and at the same time, I landed a part-time job working for Scottish Television. Um, that was that was as a digital archiving assistant. So all these things that you have now, like BBC iPlayer, STV Player, all these online players, 
were in their kind of infancy. I think the only one that had really taken off at that point was the BBC's iPlayer. So um, I'd, I'd, I'd also done an internship uh, at the at the BBC while I was at uni as well. Um, so having you know looked at both of those, I had uh, an understanding that you know this is this needs to be put online. So they were they were in the process of just converting warehouses of tapes for um, for in- inclusion uh, in their online players. So yep, I spent spent a summer working Monday to Friday working in the bookies, and then Saturday and Sunday working at STV. And at the weekends, I didn't know this before I started, I went along for the interview and it's this bustling, busy place, lots of energy, people working in media, doing lots of stuff. I went in for my first shift on the Saturday and was the only bugger in the building. There's <laughs> nobody there. It was me, me, and the, me and the cleaner and then every now and again you would see, um, I think in the afternoon, Sean Batty came in, did his, his stint doing the weather and then disappeared again. And that was it. I spent spent pretty much six months working by myself at weekends in STV, just converting tapes. But it was it was great in that up until that point, I I hadn't done any digital any editing of video at all whatsoever. So this gave me a kind of you know insight into here's how to edit videos. And at that point, I started to. Kind of editing my own stuff, which then when I came to doing the master's course came in so handy being able to work with video and audio, especially when you're doing audio post-production for video, you know, the, the two of them just kind of went hand in hand. So, yep, worked out worked out perfectly. So, yeah, at that point, the, the master's course was really one of the only things it was about in, in that. It was either in Glasgow or there was a similar course that was in Brighton. I applied for both, but I just didn't want to go all the way down to, to the south coast of England. I thought, so good friends here, I've got family here. I can move to Glasgow and that gives me a taste of independence and freedom. So yeah, moved out of home, moved to a flat in Glasgow that just happened to be less than a quarter of a mile away from where I needed to be which again suited me fine for being able to roll out my bed as a student in the morning. Five minutes later, I'm in class. It was great. So you mentioned a bit about learning to um, do edit your own stuff. So what type of things do you normally work on, whether it's now or back then? Back back then, um, they, used, they used software like, a, I think it was called Tailstream Pipeline was for, sorry, before that you would use Final Cut. So Final Cut uh, for editing video. And it was at the it was at, at a point where um, the there was a big a big kind of uh, controversy with old old uh, phone in lines in the BBC at the time, where it turned out that these these were premium rate numbers and people would they, they would reuse the numbers or something, but sometimes they didn't, and people would see an old competition that had come up because a program from 20 years ago had suddenly been put in an online player. They would see an old competition, phone up, be charged a fortune because nobody deactivated the old number. And then they've got no hope of winning this competition because, you know, it was 20 years ago, somebody's already won it. So, um, yeah, when I was editing, the first thing that we learned to do was to go through, scan through, you know, the program that you'd taken from tape, recorded in real time into the computer, scan through it, and then um, find things like adverts and um, adverts and competition lines and stuff like that and go and take them out. So it was just basic, very basic editing, like how to do cuts, how to fade to black, how to, you know, bring in bring in the next section. You then had to learn about all the different uh, analog formats that were there, things like, wow, from VHS tapes to DVC tapes, DVC Pro tapes, even as far back as Betamax and even further than that, we you had to learn how to how to handle all of them and how to how to kind of conform them to modern standards. But you would even get things like every now and again you would see the the colour starting to change as you're watching the thing go in and realizing that the tape head and the machine had got dirty. So it was a real, real crossover point from analog to digital. You're literally digitizing the analog stuff. But you still had to have enough know-how to work in both the digital realm and the analog realm. Like, if this tape head's dirty, what what do I do? Well, do you need to open the thing up and clean it? Right? Okay. So, um, yeah. Well, maybe not open it up. That was more of a text downstairs that would do that. But you know, we had tape cleaning head tape head cleaner tapes 
so you had to had to know how to use those. So um, yeah, so basic that that kind of taught me basic editing. We would then export that. They would put it into a server and it would get uploaded online. You know, make sure that you don't hit the big red delete button and delete everything that's there. You know, stuff like that. But it, it gave you a kind of insight into kind of file hierarchy as well. So how to how to maintain things, how to keep it clean. So now for me, I, I, I've got my own little YouTube channel where I do like my own, I, I use it for unlisted videos so that if I want to post a video for sending to pupils, like something that's specific for their lesson, I'll just unlist it, make it private and send it to them. So only the person with the link can view it. But then every now and again, I'll get requests where I've maybe done a cover of a, a song by a band like, I don't know, Biffy Clyro or something like that. And I'll get asked, how did how did you do that? That song's only just out like three days ago. Could you break it down and put it into lessons so that other people can learn it? And yeah, I, I quite enjoy doing that. For me, it's really just that's a little bit of a pastime. And if it brings it, if it brings me more students that that want to learn and want to pay for lessons, then that's great. So I do that as well. So um, yeah, that's that's really what I use my my video editing skills for. It's just just that sort of stuff. So you said you went back to do a master's uh, for the commercial music. So what made you do that? Did you just like the university that much, or was it another decision? Um, the the master's wasn't at wasn't at University of Scotland. The master's was at Glasgow. Was through hosted through Glasgow University, and uh, the it was based at the Glasgow School of Art. So again, it was really just that thing of I got to the end of uni and wasn't wasn't in any bands or anything, and thought. You know, I don't know what direction do I want to go here. Do I want to do music or do I want to do sound? At that point, I thought I wanted to do sound. So went and did the master's course. And then at the end of it, I found that job competition was very, very fierce in that field. Um, applied applied to the BBC to work on their sound pool. Didn't get it. Um, meanwhile, other friends were working, already working in that field doing... Uh, you know, I think one one worked for a company called Term TV. Another one who became a flatmate for a while, my friend Javi. Um, he works as a location sound man, and just sharing a flat with somebody and seeing them, you know, really, really having to compete really fiercely. You know, I, this is towards the end of the masters, having to compete really fiercely with other industry professionals for the little bits of work that were going here and there made me think. I don't know if I want to do that. So, you know, I went went and studied the masters purely just because it just seemed like a it seemed like a logical follow on for me. But and I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. Um, I I wouldn't have met half the people that I have um, if I hadn't gone. So for me, it was it was really good and that it, it kind of opened up networks to knowing different people and getting to see different parts of industries and things and be able to kind of figure out. A lot, a lot of, for me, further education was really just trying to figure out your place in the world and kind of fi- figure out where you want to go next. I mean, a lot of people, there's a lot of pressure, I think, put on kids when you're in secondary school, like age 15, 16, to decide what you want to do with the rest of your life. Um, I've always just kind of been of the opinion that, you know, if, if, if there's something that really interests me, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be it could be woodworking. It could be you know doing playing guitar. It could be you know doing anything. If something interests me and I think it's worth pursuing and I can make some level of job out of it, then yeah, why not? Why not follow it and see where it goes? So yeah, I've always just kind of seen to follow my interests. So um, yeah, the master's degree was just for me just a purely logical follow on from from finishing my honours degree. So yeah, that was it. I just decided to do it and see where it went. So after your master's then, like where, what did you end up doing then? At that point, again, I, I, I kept on the job working in the bookies um, and it got, after after I left the master's, I kind of had a slump of not playing music, not being in a band and doing this, doing this job that at one point I ended up working, I think towards Christmas one year, I was working like 75 hour weeks and not really getting a break, but you'd go in at half eight in the morning, open the shop at nine, run the way right the way through to 10 o'clock at night and sometimes you'd have a mistake in the accounting. 
you had to fix it before you could leave so you wouldn't be out there till half 10, 11. You'd go home exhausted, wake up the next day, rinse and repeat and that to me was so crushing. I just couldn't do it. So I talked with my flatmate, I talked with my girlfriend at the time, um, who's now my wife. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I talked with both of them and I said, I don't know what to do. And it was my flatmate that pointed out, he said, man, every night when you come home, if you've had a rough day, the first thing you do is go over the corner, pick up your guitar and just play. And that seems to make you happy. He's like, if that's making you happy, you need to just quit and make that your job. Um, and I then, you know, I made a deal with him uh, in front of in front of uh, my girlfriend uh, Amy. I made a deal with my flatmate that if I hadn't quit my job in two months, he could punch me in the face. Which, as far as I'm aware, is a legally binding contract because it's verbal in front of. Me. So I didn't want to get punched in the face, so I quit my job, and that that okay. was it. Um, I quit my job and I started off teaching teaching guitar, and that. Um, that was where I went from there, just teaching guitar. And that eventually, you know, teaching and having your name covering covering for wedding bands, you know, um, I've always had a knack of being able to learn a lot of music in a very short amount of time, which I discovered there was a lot of wedding bands about. And every now and again, they would need cover. Somebody, you know, wouldn't want to do a gig, but the rest of the band did. So I kind of put my name out there saying, you know, I'm, I'm available to cover for all these other bands. You know, you give me a set list, I'll turn up and play it. Doesn't matter what key it's in, you can, you know, throw it to me in any key, it'll be fine. So, um, yeah, did did that and that got my name out there doing, as I say, kind of a go-to guy for doing that sort of stuff. And then through that, um, I had a contact that was in a, in a wedding band who came into contact with somebody that was in the ABBA tribute band that I now play for. And um, they were looking for a new guitarist at the time. And, you know, they were saying, you know, it needs to be somebody that can learn and learn fast and, you know, isn't going to shy away from doing a big gig and, you know, putting on the sparkly outfit, etc. And um, my name kept coming up for them. So again, that was one of those right place at the right time type things. I got, got a phone call asking if I wanted to try out. That's the dog just popping up a fur ball over there. <laughs> So I got, got a phone call from that and that's, like I said, right place, right time and the rest is a phase history, I just took off from there. Yeah, it just worked out. I think we'll go into your second song by Biffy Clyro. Do you want to tell me why you picked that one? Yeah, this one's a little bit of a soppy story. Um, Biffy, for me, being from being from Ayrshire, you know, um, Biffy are this, just that little bit older than me and they just seem to be a constant source of inspiration of being able to look at a band. When you come from the west of Scotland and you're growing up and you people ask you, what do you want to do for a living? And you say, oh, I want to be in a band. I want to play guitar. You get hit with that. Why don't you get a real job? And people you know, of an older generation don't really realize that that is a real job. Somebody has to do it. Um, and been watching Biffy just take off, you know, do, put in the really hard work when they, you know, when they first started out, watching them really chip at it. I mean, look at them now. How well has that paid off? So, yeah, they're a band that I'm immense, immensely proud of. But Breathe Her, um, when Amy and I started dating in about 2006, we used to frequent the Harbour Lights in Irvine and go to the jam, not the jam night, the open mic night in there. So we'd only been going out about a week or so and we went in there and there was a, an open mic night on and Amy said, oh, why, why don't you go up? And I, she's like, go up, go up and play me something. So the song that I played for Amy was Breather. That was 2006 and in 2019 we had that as the first dance at our wedding. So I know you mentioned a bit about tribute bands. Uh, I think you mentioned Queen and ABBA. Do you want to tell me how you got involved in both of them? Yeah, well, the, the Queen band, um, at a point when I was about maybe 17 or 18, I'd been going to, going to a guy in Kilmarnock uh, for guitar lessons and he was um, he was in the process of trying to take some of his students and his brother taught, taught drums. So they were in the process of trying to take some of their students and put them together into, into bands and see if they could get a couple of tribute acts off the go, uh, off the ground, sorry, and on the go. And the one that, that 
kind of piqued my interest. I just remember going in for a guitar lesson one day and the, the tutor saying to me, do you, do you really like the band Queen? I said, yeah, I absolutely love Queen. And they said, well, um, trying to get this band together, would you be interested in maybe trying out for playing the guitar? I said, yeah, that, that sounds great. And um, he basically gave me a list of songs and said, what we're going to do is, I'm not introducing you to the band uh, right now, what I want you to do is go away, learn every bit of all of these songs to the point where you could play them blindfolded and then we'll have our first rehearsal. So I remember walking into the walking into the first rehearsal, you know, hi, how you doing? Shaking hands, everybody meeting each other. And then we I think one of the, the first songs we went into was um uh Now I'm Here by Queen and um just launching in from the word go the band just it just had it so that that was it we just um we just started going out and gigging um oh well, i say maybe not straight away we, we had a couple of rehearsals but again because everybody had went and rehearsed their parts this to me was like an eye opening of how to put if you're doing a tribute band how to put it together was go and learn everything first make sure you know the, the music inside out upside down back to front so that when you walk out on stage, you're unflappable and that you know your stuff. You can you can have somebody heckling at you and you know shouting whatever, and you learn to just ignore it and just do what you're doing. Or if you really want to, you can engage them and talk while while you're still you know shredding away. Um, but yeah, that that was great. So we we didn't really do too many gigs doing that because you know we were all all younger and we all had. You know, people were doing different things. I think the drummer eventually, he was a bit younger than us, and he went off to uni, went to Dundee. We got another drummer, and then um, something something else happened, and we weren't being managed anymore. And at that point, I was kind of neck deep in uni work. The singer had something else going on, so eventually, we all just decided, ah, let's let's just leave it. So that that sort of like petered out. But then um, the the ABBA thing, the the ABBA tribute band I play with is called ABBA Mania. They've been going since 1999. I didn't join until 2012. So you know they've they've really carved out a niche, and you know they they, they kind of came along a little bit bef- either before or around about the time of the original Mamma Mia stage show, and you know kind of cornered, cornered a little bit of um, market there that ABBA and Queen for me are both bands that are on a level of I don't trust people that say they don't like a single song by either of them. I'm like, there's got to be something. You know, people that say, oh, I hate Queen, you're like, yeah, but I bet you'll get drunk in the pub and start, yeah. you know, singing along, exactly. don't stop me now. You know, Dancing Queen comes on. Everybody gets up. Doesn't matter what age you are. Some everybody gets up and has a wee dance. So yeah, the the Abba Mania, they've they've been going since 1999, like I said. And I just seem to I got a phone call saying, you know, we're we're looking for a new guitarist. I thought, right, it's great. How how busy are we talking? They said, well, we're off. Uh, we're going to um, be off touring in the Philippines. And I said, great, sign me up. I'll do that. He said, right, that's great. You start the week we get back. But great. So, <laughs> I, I, typical. They are, they are, to be fair to him, he's he'd put in the, the hard work over the years, so it, it would have been great for him to go out on a on a high doing a, a big tour like that across there. Yeah, so, um, I got th- thrown in thrown in at the deep end, and again with this band, um, I was prepared for you know knowing the songs before doing a single gig so I didn't have a single rehearsal with the with the ABBA band I literally from the first gig um, that was it you were out out gigging out you know doing it um, and you know doing ultimately what a professional musician does is gigging for money so that that was it from the first first gig that I did that was I was being paid and I thought wow this is great so yeah at that point I thought this this is the way to do it you, you need to you need to, f- to be earning a living and if you can be in a band that's busy enough and that's you know that's a really lucky uh, unfortunate position to be in then yeah I thought this this is it I've, I've found I think I've found a home here I like this 
Um, so yeah, that, that's it. So they're probably, the, the, they're probably about it, the, the busiest band I've ever worked with was uh, ABBA Mania. Yeah, very good. So um, yeah. is there any gigs or performances that stand out to you as like really memorable or enjoyable? Um, gigs, gigs playing or gigs as a spectator or both? I guess both. Mostly playing, but I'm open to all stories. <laughs> playing, playing for me, um, I think probably the best or my favourite gig that I've ever done was um, walking out at the the Royal Concert Hall in Glasgow. So to me, it feels like a like a home gig. You know, having been a student and going and seeing bands and things playing in the Royal Concert Hall, thinking, "Wow, I'd love to play here one day." To then going out there for a Christmas gig with a with Abomania on stage in front of like two and a half thousand people walking out in the darkness with um I actually built I don't I don't know how big an ABBA fan you are but I built a replica of the the guitar that they won the Eurovision with which is this like 13 pointed it, it divides, it really splits taste right down the middle, this guitar, because it's impressive and that it's completely over the top. But a lot of people look at it and go, wow, that's ugly. <laughs> and um, I called my guitar for that reason. It's inscribed on the um, on the pickguard, it's inscribed Marmite, because you either love it or hate it. So um, yeah, walking out in the darkness is the, you know, the, the intro to, um, I think it was the Mamma Mia is is you know is is playing the keys are starting the band have already started and then I walk out in the darkness and go center stage with this guitar that I've built in a workshop out of shelves um, but it's the sparkliest thing that you've ever seen hitting I've got a little button in the back and I bury the LEDs and an LED controller inside the guitar so every one of the light every one of the points on this guitar lights up so walking out in the darkness clicking the button, spinning around to the crowd and then lunching into that and the place just going absolutely bush. That That is my favourite memory of gigging ever. Um, as for favourite gig I think I've ever been to, um, I was lucky enough to be at the Led Zeppelin reunion thing down in London in 2007 and I've been a Led Zeppelin nut ever since since I picked up a guitar, like got really, really nerdy about about finding out everything about every track. What studio was it recorded at? What gear did they use? You know, what was going on at the time? You know, um, the so Led Zeppelin for me is an absolute, absolute huge love. And growing up in an era where you know it's a band that are considered gone, done you know, thinking oh, I'll never get the chance to see that, to then get the chance to go and see that, you know, couldn't turn it down. Um, I had people asking to buy my tickets off me for insane amounts of money, like in 20 grand, and just telling them, no, this gig is worth more. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, am, I am not selling this. So I actually gave my, or sold my, my, my second ticket um, to my friend Greg that lived across the road. Um, I thought, you know, he's as big as it when that as I am. I thought, you know, if anybody's going to appreciate going to this gig, it's him. So yeah, me and Greg went all the way down to London uh, and, you know, seeing Zeppelin is just jaw dropping. So yeah, that, that's probably <laughs> yeah, the best gig. Yeah, I can imagine that actually. <laughs> the atmosphere, because there was so much build up to it and it was, it was in the news and in the television for like six months before it happened. And then the gig get postponed by a month or so. Um, you know, the, the atmosphere and the build up to it was just absolutely electric. Like the, the atmosphere, even on the day you had to go there with the ID to pick up your tickets at the Millennium Dome, like bef hours before the gig, which that was the first time I'd ever had to have ID in the car that you bought the tickets with to get the tickets. And they slapped like a wristband thing on you as well to make sure that you are the person that's paid for the tickets that's going to the gig. So the, I have had no idea what was going on with that, but it was it was just absolutely magical. It was like all my all my Christmases had come at once. Yeah, like a dream come true almost. <laughs> yeah. So, what songs or artists would you say inspire? 
inspire you the most, whether it's just with like your personal taste or with the tributes? Um, for me, um, you know, I, I I had a tough time when I was in secondary school in that I was diagnosed with leukemia when I was 15. So, you know, I kind of struggled to get through, just to get through, to get through secondary school. Like, I went from being like a top of the class student to then suddenly not being there for a lot of periods of time and like really having to struggle to pull my grades back up. And I became aware of a guitarist called Jason Becker. Don't know if you've ever heard of him. Um, Jason, Jason um, was like every guitarist's dream. He was about an absolute virtuoso when he was a teenager. And when Eddie Van Halen left, it, like when Van Halen split and David Lee Roth went went solo, David Lee Roth got a guitarist called Steve Vai, who's regarded as like one of the greatest guitarists of all time. When Steve Vai left David Lee Roth's band, he got in this 19-year-old kid called Jason Becker. And Jason Becker could outshred anybody. But he was diagnosed with uh, motor neurons disease. And that was like, I think, late 80s. You know, he's in the studio and the guy starts stumbling and realising that something's wrong. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've been there. I remember realising, out delivering papers and stuff and realising something, something's not right here. But um, Jason Becker went on to record, he, he, you know, the guy became like enclosed in his own body and he's still alive. And he's, he's kind of in a similar position to what Stephen Hawking was and that he's, he's in a wheelchair. But, you know, seeing somebody that's got that much of a passion for music that they don't let being encased in their own body stop them from writing and composing music. Jason composed an entire album by blinking at a computer screen one note at a time and then got, it was recorded, it sounds a bit dated now because it was like mid-90s kind of midi, but the compositional arrangements that are there are just so jaw-dropping to me that somebody can do this that I thought, I remember seeing this as a teenager and thinking, you know, wow, if, if he can do that, you know, I, I can't let this hold me back. So I remember being on lots of chemotherapy drugs and I'd come to guitar before going through that. So looking at a guitar and knowing I want my, my fingers to go here and struggling to get them to move just made me so much more determined that I wasn't going to give up. And um, yeah, Jason, Jason Becker was the, the inspiration that really got me through a lot of that and then um, yeah I I just I just saw the guy as an absolute hero and the fact that he's still going now he released an album I think not the last tour I did but the tour before he released another album and again composed entirely composed by blinking at a computer screen to get the notes in order but this one had an absolute star-studded lineup of rather than doing it in midi they got actual gu guitarists in and it's your guitarists guitarists that recognize that had jason becker not been ill you know people he, he would be so famous it would be like slash who? who who are we talking about Oh yeah, Jason Becker, yeah, everybody knows him. So um, <laughs> yeah, J Jason Becker's an absolute, absolute hero for me. But um, other than that, um, I'd have to say, just your your, your kind of um, workaday musicians, like I, I, I'm honestly of the belief that the people that are virtuosic and, you know, are famous for being absolutely amazing are just some of the lucky few that have managed to get like to, to follow their dreams. There are many, many guitarists and musicians out there that do your average jobs. They work in a warehouse or they work in, you know, in Asda or something, but they go home and they, they can play as good as anybody else. Um, they just have maybe slightly different priorities. And, you know, in that in that sense, you know, I'd, I'd say my heroes are just people that are out there gigging every weekend. I love going to see, I love nothing better than going to see a local band. I, you know, it doesn't matter to me whether it's somebody that's playing Wembley Stadium or whether it's somebody that's playing the Belfield Tavern. I'll go and see Andy and just watching people put their absolute passion into what they do. I appreciate that. That, that just gets me right there. So yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Just like seeing people do what they love, even if they don't have the necessarily the means to give it up their all time, but just go out there and do what they can. Yeah. Yeah. And for me as well, it's it's not just limited to music. Um I've got a friend Jamie who 
is one of the best woodworkers I have ever, ever seen. And just watching the amount of passion that this guy puts into maybe making a cuckoo clock or something like that is insane. And I, I just, I love that. I love meeting passionate people. You know, if, if somebody is passionate about something, I will happily sit and listen to them geek out over every little minute detail because I find it fascinating. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Uh, I think we'll go into your third song then by ABBA, bring it back to ABBA, uh, it's uh, Does Your Mother Know? Yeah, Does Your Mother Know? Uh, does my mother know that I'm out there in four and a half inch platform heels and wearing silk and playing a sparkly guitar every night? Yes, my mother does. <laughs> I dare say she's, she's tickled by that vibe. But um, yeah, Does Your Mother Know is the point in the show that we do where the two lead girls would go off and because it's a it's a male lead lead song song it's a point where the two girls would go off and um, and get do a quick costume change behind the scenes but we we found that you know when when i was tethered to an amp with a guitar leading the bass players away off in the riser um, the, and the, the the guy singing it is is behind a key behind a piano. He can't get up and walk about because he's behind the piano. I mean, he's, he, I suppose he could strap on a guitar and go walk about, but it doesn't really fit with the aesthetic of ABBA. So, you know, I got um, dug out a radio lead one day, and you know, decided, you know, what well, I, I I love players like Angus Young, people that run about the stage all over the place. Um, I thought, right, I won't run because I'm in platform heels, but I'm going to, I'm determined to go and at that point act the clown, get in people's faces with the guitar. And eventually I convinced our, our bass player Lewis to do the same it's to the point where I think on one of the last tours we were playing somewhere in Ireland and this this place I noticed had stairs going up, up the, the aisle and then across the back and back down the other side and, you know, I, I just love the fact that Lewis is as game as I am to to get out there and get get in people's faces. And again, that's that's an aspect of performing that that I love seeing when I see bands. Is um, I, one of the, one of the things that just does doesn't interest me is when I see people on Instagram and they're they're playing really great, but they're just laser focused in here. They're not they're not looking about. It's it's the aspect that I think is missing from from I mean that that Instagram and YouTube world is great but it just doesn't compare to going and seeing a live band and seeing somebody that can you know that can play and entertain you or just really entertain you so yeah that's 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 what for me this song is all about it's just about having a great time getting in people's faces and just just having a laugh so um, I absolutely adore this song so I know you mentioned there about going to Ireland. So is there any other places you visited while you're touring or gigging? I've I've done um, I've done uh, mostly UK tours, like, but when I say UK tours, it's not like it's not like um, you disappear for a day or two here. It's like or like I'm going up to Dundee. I'll be gigging in Glasgow on Saturday. No, it's like you leave home at the end of September and you will see your house maybe for Christmas. So it's like. You know, you're you're away doing a lot of gigs, maybe 40, 50 gigs in between there. All right, you maybe come home for a week or so, but um, yeah, mostly for me it's been UK over into Ireland. But I've been lucky enough to go and tour again. We've we've now toured the Philippines another two another two times since since I've been in the band. We've been over and done the Philippines. In fact, we were in the Philippines last year just as the whole COVID situation started developing. And you know they were they were really taking it seriously over there. You were being temperature temperature checked as you went in and out every building. Uh, masks were being made mandatory everywhere that you went. So it was it was um, it was a really strange experience being on tour and and seeing that sort of stuff um, kind of coming in coming into the fore. But we made it back. I think just about a, we or we were home about a fortnight before the Philippines went into a sort of like. Um, airport lockdown type thing but um, yeah I absolutely love playing in the Philippines the first time we went in 2014 it was like nothing I'd ever experienced we were sort of artists in residence at the Soleil Resort in Manila which is like a six star hotel and casino you know staying there and then it turned out that we were sharing the artists in residence billing with Bruno Mars so we were in the hotel he's in the beachfront villa 
um, I did a press conference one day in this room and Bruno Mars did his press conference to the same room the next day. It was it was absolutely nuts. But um, I I loved it. It was, you know, getting to be halfway around halfway around the world and going and doing what you do for an audience that you you've never experienced an audience like that before. Like there's cultural differences and things. Um the the audience over there seemed to listen to the start of a track and they applaud at the beginning. They go like maybe two or three bars into a song. They'll, they'll just start start going nuts with their, with their applause and then it's like you think that's loud then when you get to the end it's, it's like twice as loud again it's it's wow it's just so good and you know we we get asked to do it's bizarre for me as a as a tribute band to then be asked to like sign merchandise and sit at a table afterwards for an hour or so so like the backing band they, they've clocked off and said right we're away at the pool meanwhile I'm, I'm out, you know, meeting people and signing things and just having a great time and getting to chat to people. Um, yeah, it was it was absolutely amazing. So yeah, touring the touring the Philippines got to be an absolute highlight. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like that was an amazing experience. <laughs> so um, talking about the pandemic and lockdown, how did that like affect you and your music? Um, well, how did it affect me? It, it pretty much immediately just put a halt to gigging and I went from doing you know from being on tour in the Philippines flying back home that would have been end of February beginning of March I think I did one maybe one corporate gig after that and then that was it it was like the calendar just was like wiped clear from then point or that point out I mean we had a tour booked for 2020 for October through to like Christmas again because that, that was the run that we would normally do it's like October through to Christmas and that it was put in the back burner and then it was kind of pushed back and rescheduled and now I think it's in the calendar for later this year but we're still at a point just now where as much as the vaccine rollout has happened nobody's got a crystal ball we we don't know how well this is going to go i mean it looks like we're headed in the right direction and i hope that we are but you know if if the if the tour later this year pulls off and it happens um, i'll be over the moon if it doesn't then as long as things keep going in the right direction then i'm sure that we'll get there eventually and um, it's just sad to have seen so many places like i mentioned earlier um one one of my uh local pubs that would go and see live bands they put up a thing on facebook the other day saying that that's that's saying they're shutting their doors it's you know they're they're done i think that's that's the place will be up for sale now which to me feels like the end of an era it feels sad but throughout this i've seen so many young bands um releasing music from home and you know when i was at uni um, my space was a thing and one of the lecturers hated it he just said that the proliferation of the, the platform being open to everybody just means that there's so much stuff that's of a subpar quality and I'm like yeah but I think I would argue the opposite and say that you know there's diamonds and gems in there that wouldn't otherwise have stood a chance and now you know technology has caught up so much in that in fact, I don't know if you can see behind me, that that huge half stack thing there is what I used to have to haul about when I played in a, a tribute band, played in the Queen Band. Now, when I go on the road, I took this thing in a little case to the Philippines and, you know, I can get the sound of that out of this and travel halfway around the world with it in a suitcase. You know, it's like the technology has just moved on so much that bands are now able to record stuff at home. I mean, you can master in your own bed you know, master a record in your bedroom, in your living room, whatever. If you don't feel comfortable, you can record your tracks and then email them to some guy at Abbey Road, pay them, and it'll come back absolutely polished. I find this so exciting. I think this is, is revolutionary and I think it's 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 a framework that the music industry is reluctantly moving in towards. But um I think it's I think it's exciting. I think it's fantastic. That's one yeah. thing about the pandemic. It's obviously been awful, but it's given people the chance to get creative and get, find new passions. So, gotta look at the positives. Exactly. <laughs> Here's the other thing. 
cage people up for long enough and they're going to get pissed off at something and when people get pissed off they write a lot of music so it's going to be wonderful what have you been up to then during lockdown you got any music or been up to anything else not not really i mean i whenever i'm not um when i'm not touring um i, I teach from well i used to go, go and teach people in their own homes and then the pandemic kind of put an end to that. So that forced me to catch up with the times and start teaching remotely online. So that's kept going. I've picked up a couple of extra pupils. So I, I still teach there. seven months just kind of feeling like not not really knowing what to do with myself so doing a lot of kind of practicing guitar and you know taking guitars to bits and all the kind of things that I would want to do that my schedule didn't normally allow me to do like taking things to bits and tinkering with guitars and fixing them and tweaking them I mean this this thing here I built this pretty much from scratch during uh, well finished it at the start of lockdown um, because I was quiet in January but before the tour kicked off in February but you know tink I've been tinkering with this um, I've got a, um, another guitar that's sitting over in the corner that's, that I've built from scratch I've got you know so I've spent a lot of time kind of building and tinkering with guitars um, a lot of time kind of exploring new music so uh, I think one of the bands I discovered was a band called Biba Doobie. I don't know if you've heard of them. They they kind of took off to like a kind of YouTube music thing. Um, like, like, like they were a young band that through sponsorship via like YouTube, they were like taking over. It seemed to me almost like, like a modern version of what the Warp Tour used to be, of like taking young bands and taking them out on the road. Um, yeah, so watching, I've watched their career over the past year or so and just just watching them go from strength to strength and they released an album and it is absolutely phenomenal so yeah let's seeing experimenting listening to new bands because you know I'm, I'm i'm guilty of being like one of these old rock guys of like you know i know what i like and i don't listen to much else but i kind of like made a resolution of i'm going to actually leave myself open to listening to a lot more so asking people what they're listening to and you know, I found myself listening to things like neo soul, funk, hip hop, you know, genres that I, I, I had barely ever dipped a toe in before. And now thinking, wow, there's there's a world of music here that I, I hadn't really explored before. So yeah, just having the luxury of time to sit and do that. But also being very aware of the fact that I'm self employed and didn't have any income coming in from gigging. You know, and in that respect, you know, we we had the self-employment grants, you know, to be a musician, I would say if you're going to gig and you're going to do everything by the book, you, or you've got to do everything by the book, but, you know, if you register and become self-employed, you know, keep keep your, um, keep all your books up to date and stuff like that, because, you know, if I, if I hadn't been registered self-employed, I, I would have been stuck for, for an income. So the self-employment grants kind of helped through with that. And then there was a uh, help musicians. I got a, I think I got a bursary thing through them, which also helped. But when it got towards October and, um, you know, the, the government saying that's it, the help for the self-employed is going to stop. You're on your own pretty much. I kind of took a look about and I thought, well, what are my other skill sets? You know, I like, I like going into a wood workshop. I like working with my hands. Um, I saw a job uh, lo advertised locally as an upholsterer. So from November to now, I've been working, um, as well as teaching, I've been working doing upholstery work for, for a company that's just five minutes down the road from my house, which um, has given me the security of, of a regular income coming in. Um, it would just be someone's law that I start a job and then two weeks later, the government does a complete U-turn and that thing about the self-employed not getting any help anymore. But you got, you've got to just kind of roll with it and see where, like I said, roll with it and see where it goes. But if you find something you're interested in, man, fling yourself at it and see how good you can do. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd done a little bit of upholstery work before. I'd fixed some piano stools and things like that. So 
walked into a job interview and then started started working there the next day. So um, yeah, it's been a huge learning curve because there's aspects of that job that I've, I've never experienced before. But I'm I'm absolutely loving it. I'm loving loving doing doing a job where I'm working with my hands. So yeah, absolutely loving doing that as well as still playing music, still teaching. So what are you looking most forward to then in like a post pandemic world? That's just the thing. A lot, a lot of people, when they say a post-pandemic world, they think things are going to go back exactly how they are. I don't think they are. I, I think that this, this, this whole pandemic, hopefully, you know, for me, hopefully, this has been a wake up that the world needs, and that you know, we, we really need to be a lot more sustainable in in our practices. You know, we need to look at how how we use um, how we use you know, materials and how we use, even things like we, where do people decide they're going to settle, you know, stuff like that. So hopefully it's been a wake up and that we change things for the better. But for me, I I can't wait to go to a game, <laughs> to go see a band play live. Um, I can't wait to get back out on a stage and do some playing live, whether that's here, whether it's abroad, you know, I reckon it'll be a while before we start doing touring abroad, but you know, um, Britain's an island, and there's there's plenty of bands there. So hopefully, um, we'll be able to gig at a local level, and then at national level, and then you know throughout the UK, and um, be able to go out and entertain people again. But um, yeah, I really think the the um, the first note of that first gig is just going to be absolutely euphoric. Whether it's playing the gig yourself or being in the audience at a gig. I, I'm just really looking forward to just hearing live music again. Yeah, me too. I think that's my number one thing as well. I just want to go out and be in a concert and just yeah, see some people play, play live. It'll be absolutely magic. Yeah, definitely will be. <laughs> so your fourth song then, ACDC, If You Want Blood. Tell me why you chose that one. <laughs> it's, it's a song that for me, no matter how low I can get, with you know feeling blue feeling sorry for yourself you know i've been in places that have been you know i've, I've experienced some stuff that i hope nobody else ever has to you know health wise um but no matter how low a funk i can get into that is the song that just grabs me gives me a slap about and says come on don't let that grind you down you know get out there do it it's a song that just always puts this grin in my face and it, it's it just it feels to me you know raw it's it's got it, it's simple rock and roll you know so um again this one ties back to my wedding in that i got i'm not a cheapskate but i got my sister's band to play for my own wedding and um, they practically jumped at the chance and uh, i got up in my kilt with my les paul and jammed in with my brother-in-law on drums, my sister on lead vocals, the friend uh, Mark on bass, and me doing my Angus Young stuff and shredding away. If you want blood, you got it at my own wedding. Which, you know, that's, that again, it's, it's my, my, um, my, Attitude as a musician. You want blood? You got it. Um, so Adam, just to round off, see, um, do you have any like advice for people who are like expiring art musicians or artists, and like give them some help and where to go? Yeah, um, my my advice would be, you know, it's there's there's old cliches out there of it's not what you know, it's who you know. Meet as many people as you can, listen to as much music as you can, and you know, whether whether you actually do okay and, you know, make it doing music or whether you kind of along the way find some other thing that interests you and kind of turns your head in another direction, find what you're passionate about because, you know, people always regret the chances that they didn't take rather than the chances that they took and panned out. So, you know, that that for me is, is a kind of philosophy of, you know what, try things, see where life goes, just see where it takes you. Um, you know, as, as regards music, like I said, 
um, get out there, play, 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 play and play. Play to as many people as you can. You never know who you're going to bump into. I mean, like Freddie Mercury walked into a pub and seen some band playing and the next thing you know, we've got Queen. You know, it's it's all, all these little connections are like like little little bumps along a road that's taking you somewhere. Um, don't be afraid to, to get out there. No, that's it. So it's whether when I say get out there, at the moment, yeah, that, that's a little bit limited and they're all stuck in, but hey, you can still get your stuff out there. You've got technology now that I didn't have when I was like 15 or 16 years old. Like you can put stuff out there, you can self-publish an al- like sorry, self-release an album. You can get in contact with, with places that can put, put your stuff onto like limited edition vinyl and stuff like that. If you think you can do it and, and you want to give it a go, do it. Get stuff out there and you never know where it's going to go. So that's that's my advice is just, you know, go at it, see where it takes you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Okay, so that's okay. the end of the show. This has been 3TFM Radio. That's been Adam Robertson. I'm Hayley Anderson. And thank you very much for listening. No problem. Catch you later. Okay.